Welcome, welcome. We got another episode of The Weird Way here. I have the beautiful Beck Sahara here today and I am excited for this conversation. We are going to be exploring everything magic, feminine empowerment and probably quite, quite a few rabbit holes along the way. And one of the reasons I'm excited for this conversation, Beck is someone that I see holds a very specific frequency in this world and how she operates. She literally, just before this conversation, named this the magic conversation (laughs) uh, and that I appreciate. And if you're watching this, you would see her and she is a very magical person. And, And one of the things that I think she really holds in this world and that I really see in her work is the ability to be connected to the spiritual realms while also hold and, and maintain a grounded approach in the material world and in the material plane and allowing herself to enjoy the material plane as well, which I, I can find at times people avoid and neglect. And for me, that's a great tragedy. Mm. So, Beck, I'm very, very excited to have you here. Welcome to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Welcome everybody to the magic, the magic conversation. The magic conversation. (laughs) Oh, oh, where could we go with (coughs) all of this? So uh, I think I'll ask with the first one because people might be like, magic, where are they going? Where, Mm -hmm. where? Mm -hmm. And so being the magic conversation, Mm -hmm. what is magic to you? Mm. Oh, such a challenging question sometimes, but I also... I can do it. So, (laughs) um, to me, magic is, um, I use it synonymously with the word alchemy, Mm. which means to change something's state and, or to transmute, which means to change something's state. So from water to wine. So in healing and spiritual embodiment, we're trying to, um, do magic or alchemy to alchemize the unhelpful energies and unintegrated things within us to allow the beautiful light of the higher self to come through. And <clears throat> in order for that to happen, we have to have a change of energetic state. And literally we have to move um, old stored energetic debris and clear it out of the way by starting to vibrate at and retrain the vibration in our energetic field, in our energetic field to be um of the higher self essence that is within us but we don't hold it all the time so it's this retraining of the energetic field um and then if you so if you think about that if, okay magic and alchemy means to change the state and to go to higher frequency you could also say that it means healing mm. you know when we're talking about any kind of healing what you're doing is changing this the energetic state mm. any kind yeah mm. I really love this for me when you're talking about this and connecting the words magic and alchemy Mm -hmm. and for myself like reflecting on the alchemy of old and the stories of that where we had these alchemists and they're looking to turn lead into gold Mm -hmm. and it's a classic example where here transmuting and changing a heavier material the lead into something of a more pure state and the connections and the correlations between that and healing and just allowing more of ourselves into this world because for me that is what it is when we're when we're going through that alchemy it's like oh here more of me is that higher self you speak of yeah totally and it's always there it's just that the the frequencies are incoherent and they're out of alignment that higher self is always there the gold is always w- within and yeah, and the alchemists, old alchemists, so cool. Um, <laughs> they were just doing and exploring it on a physical level as well, but also seeing that as an exemplifying what it can mean for within as well. Mm. It's really cool. Mm. And uh, I think a few people might be familiar with the book, The Alchemist, Paulo Cali- mm. here, and he shows this in a really powerful way. Of there is a story of the boy going off and on the adventure, and he's looking to for i can't remember what he's actually looking for adventure or he's i actually haven't read it oh but well. i everyone says i need to read it yeah, yeah. you, you, <laughs> you <laughs> most definitely I should probably read it you, th- this is your invitation to yeah. read it it's one of my favorite favorite books and 
And in the end, there's a guy who's like more traditional alchemy looking to purify something to create gold, the substance. Mm -hmm. And the boy, he more goes on the internal journey of transforming himself into what he needs to be to eventually find the gold in the external. But before he did that, he had to find the gold within and realize that he could transform himself. Mm -hmm. And... I, I think this is one of the most powerful things. When we're in this world, a lot of people can be focused on external results. Oh, I, I want the house, I want the money, I want the relationship. And when I hear that, it's like, cool, yeah, that's all possible. That's that's beautiful to have that desire. But what's happening within first? Who do I need to be to actually achieve that and become that? Uh, and I'm curious within your own work, like when people are, because some of your work is based around a lot of the material or like pulling people from that way to connect them to the inner worlds and how that works. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, people come with their intentions or their goals to manifest whatever thing. Mm. I don't know. I just tell them it's not. You got it. <laughs> I'm just like, girl, <laughs> it's not about that. Like it, mm. it does not matter. The external is always a side effect of the internal. And, you know, in my work, I guess people come with basically those lower frequencies within themselves that are sitting in the way of the external, um, the ability to build into the third dimension what the external thing they're trying to get. And then recognising also that the external thing that we desire is always, it's actually just about the feeling, the frequency feeling and emotion are the same thing, um, frequency and emotion are the same thing. It's always just about what that I think that's going to give me. Mm. And that's why when you do the alchemy within, that thing appears because now you are through law of mirroring or attraction, a vibrational match. And so in my work, I'm um, holding space for, for women to do that magic within themselves to meet with difficult emotions and those low frequencies you know, because if you don't have your manifestation or your desire, the question becomes, okay, like if you were in alignment with it, you would have it. Mm. Um, yeah, and helping people to to stand in their power and find that power from within, okay, that there's no power outside. Mm. It, like it's a, such an illusion. When you really get that, you're like, holy shit, I'm just like, everyone's just running around like, crazy like we don't remember it's crazy Mm -hmm. it's not a way to live as a spiritual being no yeah no we we can play that game of oh when that happens i'll do that or if that person does that then i'll be able to do that and it can give away our power if we're not being like oh i'm gonna do this regardless regardless if i have the resources or what's going on and actually commit to that because for me every time i've done that when i said i'm doing this i don't know how it's gonna happen Mm -hmm but I'm going to do this because this is what I need to do and this is what is true for me. Mm-hmm. The universe makes it happen and that feels like woo-woo. It feels like wildness, but when I've fully committed and been like this is what's happening and not moved away from my path, I know that that's what happens and it's like sometimes it's like, Dean, you're a little bit delusional. I was having this conversation the other day. I was like, am I delusional or am mm-hmm. I creating the reality? Mm-hmm. And this is something I think a lot of people can forget of our own power. And you mentioned earlier that a lot of the time it's lower frequencies that can stop people from getting to that ability to really anchor into the power. Mm -hmm. Uh, And like, what are lower frequencies? Hmm. Well, if you really fundamentally look at it, a lower vibration, what I'm saying is that there is an obstruction to the ability of the higher self essence, which is a spiritual substance of light um, that centralizes in the heart area and we then attempt to spread into the rest of our being. Um, these, that light has been obstructed by basically, if you know the Buddhist term samskaras, scars in the energetic field, um, So there can be scars that are creating injuries that are from us holding on to painful old experiences and a kind of like energetic debris that lives in there as well. Um, And 
I guess frequency is just a term to try to describe the spectrum of light because we are light and we are made of light that you know if I'm vibrating at the radiance of the light of the God force then I'm in a high frequency of light and if I'm not then I'm in a low frequency but it's almost like it can also be put that like that grief so you know if we're going to integrate something like grief that we just want to release that stored stuff and then joy has always been there so it's almost like that the low frequencies they don't exist as a thing on their own if that makes sense like it's just an obstruction to light it's, it's very cool mm. this like energetic stuff that's, yeah mm. Mm. Uh, and I'd and we feel it as negative emotions i would add mm. yeah uh, and and I'd want to. I, I want to go into this and maybe get some clarity on, on how you view this because I think some people can view, say, emotions, certain emotions, anger, sadness, grief, mm. uh, as negative. And, and what I was hearing then is like there was an ob- obstruction to life that mm. creates a lower vibration. Mm-hmm. And for me, if I to, if I am to feel lo- those emotions and allow them to move through me. I'm actually meeting them in love, which is a high emotion to just allow them to move through me. But when I close off to them, generally it's guilt or shame, which creates an obstruction within myself Mm -hmm. that then closes them emotions, which creates a lower vibration. And I'm I'm curious if that's how you view it as well. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, also that, so the grief or whatever itself is the pain of the absence of the pain of the distance between the low emotion or uh, between you and God Mm -hmm. within yourself. It's the pain and and it just comes in different flavors depending on where it's sitting in our chakras and where it's like what we're believing and all these things and we call all all of that emotion, Mm. if that makes sense. Mm. And then, yes, you can add, you know, guilt and shame on top of things and that's just adding another resistance and restriction. And um, whereas... Yeah, to meet them with love. Like I always remember I had some initiations with the Buddha who, in spirit who was teaching me about this one time when I was really dealing with a lot. And he just showed me in vision and everything that hit. Like if we're to look at the something like the Buddha, it's not it, – emotions are holy mm. and that we are meant to feel them because they're a feedback system of where – like how close you are to – like the most wholeness of your spirit. And so we have to honour them and be aware of them and like we wouldn't be able to navigate the realm that we're in if we didn't. So he was talking about just if the Buddha, who's like a really pure being, just as an example, was to feel deeply feel emotions and he deeply feels them, like deeply feels, you know, Buddha still gets sad and feels grief and all of that, but he has no resistance to it. So it passes through so quickly and so P, and that's why they say that peace is the um, um, peace is the absence of resistance. Mm-hmm. You know, it's to suffering is when you resist. The pain is not the problem; it's the resistance. There's nothing wrong with pain when you don't feel um, resistance towards negative emotions. You feel peace, like the Buddha did, and you feel peace when you're grieving, and you feel peace when you're mm-hmm. in pain, and yeah, and I've experienced that through, you know, lots of journeys and stuff. And I remember when he taught me that, it was so incredible. I, I learned, okay, like I can feel this horrific feeling mm. and feel peace. It's weird, mm. but it's freedom. Mm. When you say that, I, I feel at that point when he came to you, there was a lot moving for you and a lot, like yeah. it was a big initiation. Yeah. A- and so I'm curious of your own experience. Like <coughs> when when teachings were coming in and, and how you were able to navigate that of whatever it was you were experiencing at that time? Yeah, well, at that time I was deep in really severe PTSD from the trauma I experienced as a child and I was, I remember when he was working with me, I was just flooded every day with with really bad triggers and like, because of the extremity of the trauma that I went through, it was a lot of suffering. And I was trying to, um, I was trying to fix it. 
So I was in suffering because I was resisting so much. My resistance was so high because of the feelings running through my body and everything of being very violently hurt and everything and I couldn't stop them. And I was at that time when he was came to me that day or few days, I was really being tortured by my own inner experience of just my, you know, th- techniques and stuff weren't working. And I was just like, f- and I was trying to make it work. And when you're trying to, you're trying to fix the pain that you have, you're not approaching it from love. So all you're doing is adding resistance. Mm. Nothing transmutes if you don't have the energy of presence and acceptance. So he came to me and I just, um, yeah, I mean, as and as a psychic, how I was navigating that was like, you know, I was deeply flooded and having a terrible day and a terrible time. But I always call out to spirit. I was saying, help me, help me. And I, I guess the navigation is that I can hear spirit and I can see in vision. And he taught me like, you know, like, you don't get it. Like, you know, there is peace in just being. And so he, even just his presence allowed me to allow myself to feel more to be willing to feel and when I became willing to feel even though it was horrific I felt a little sliver of peace and I was like what (laughs) and um yeah he was like you know it's not about doing anything other than being with what is if we all just sat and bead with what is we would be enlightened Mm. right away when, when I hear that and the ability you you allowed yourself to just slow to be mm. and and, uh, and uh, I know for myself in states of that where I want to avoid I want to run away I want to I want to escape or I want to fix the pain and whatever I do it's still there under it and there's no escape in the moments and and sometimes the hardest thing is also the easiest because mm. it, it's the way through it's the way to the other side and it sounded like in that moment where you allowed yourself to truly slow and just be like okay I can meet this yeah exactly because that's what it is like it was a moment of and what it is is to say okay like this is like this experience in internal external situation feeling whatever it is Nothing you do is going to stop something that already is. Mm -hmm. It already exists. Mm -hmm. But in our minds, in our weird, like, emotional habits, we think, like, yeah, like, your brain wants to get in there and control the feeling. And it's like, no, but you're feeling that. Mm -hmm. And so what helped me in that moment was what he was saying, but also to see the absolute futility Mm -hmm. of that battle. Mm -hmm. To be like, when you, when I think that you can meet acceptance in a really and be in peace in a really deep way when you can have that realization in a really deep way of the um the futility of fighting what already is alive Mm. here in this world or your life or your internal experience you can't change the fact that you feel i couldn't change the fact that i was being flooded with torture feelings Mm. so i said and i had to find and i think that depending on the level of what you're facing what I share with people and what I what I did was like to find resource within so I had Buddha and everything and I was like okay like this I'm gonna find the yes in me like my magic practice is that I have to find the yes in me so often you have to find the part of you that's fighting first Mm. and and the part of you that also is holding on to what you have got going on and you're like get rid of it there's actually always a part of us it's like no it's mine (laughs) this is who i am yeah it's like no it's my identity (laughs) and you're like nope you gotta you have and that's you have to be willing to die that's the ego death and when you can find that and i got into a practice of getting this and being like okay this is what i need to do this for me is that real moment of surrender. Yeah. Of, of actual surrender. Yeah. N- not not the 
one I can see at times where I surrender to the current of like flow and all of that, but surrender to the internal experience and what we're going through in that moment. And when I hear this and your experience there, I feel in that surrender and I've journeyed with this myself where I can fight and I want to resist and I feel disempowered because I'm trying to get away from it. But there's a moment where when we embrace it and allow it to move through us, that we actually find our strength as well Mm -hmm. and our power. Mm -hmm. And in, in your experience there, did that occur where you found your own internal yeah, absolutely, because, you know, that's just one example of many hundreds, thousands of times that I had to sit with really extreme PTSD reactions and feelings and I understood that um, nothing I do except connecting to my higher self and sitting down and doing that work is going to free me mm. at all and that there's no power in doing anything else. So... I completely found my power. Like that's how I healed myself from everything that I went through Um, because, yeah, that's that's how I healed myself. And even in my therapy sessions, like I'll sit there, my therapist gets me and kind of like she's like, okay, you do your thing. And therapy is very helpful to help you with grounding and coping and a relationship and all this holding space, all the things. But I learned like, okay – when I had a trigger, go inside, mm-hmm. go inside, go inside, go inside, surrender, say yes, because you're not going to move. And that was so powerful because that's where, that's the only place where your power is and that's where all the acceleration is as well. Mm. Like if you go towards, turn around and go towards what you're resisting, what's going to happen? Like you're going to go get to where you want to go. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that is powerful to yeah. actually... Like for me, that's facing the fear yeah. to go towards the one thing that most of us probably don't want to go towards and be willing to see what's there. Mm-hmm. Because if, and I, I know this from like my entire life, I tried to run. And when we're running, we're not in our power. We're not connected to who we are because there's some part of ourselves that we're refusing to face. And if that's true, if we're disowning any part of ourselves, we're not going to be in our power because we're not whole. Mm. and in that moment of turning and facing something like this and being like okay i'm gonna meet this because i know when i've done that i've I've met parts of myself that i rejected abandoned disowned dishonored and it's like oh that's me that's Mm. me Mm. and i get to take them i get to grab Mm. them and bring them back inside and be like Dean, come back to all of who you are, not not the parts you thought you had to be, not the parts that have been hurt. Bring everyone home. Yeah. And that's a journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really a journey of integration, mm. not to move away from low frequencies or, you know, negative emotions and stuff, but to, um, as you say, meet with them, so be willing to feel, really. Well, all we're doing, everyone, it's just trying not to feel <laughs> like that's all no, no like, feeling that's what this incarnation is it's just like trying to allow yourself to move through what's what's already alive here mm. and and then you naturally come into your essence mm-hmm. one of the things that's been really exciting me upon my own journey and i, I see reflected in other people's journeys i, I see two paths of spirituality mm. the, the upward ascent and the downward descent and I, what i find is most people generally have an initial upward ascent of looking to escape the world of mm. wanting to escape their pain get away from themselves whatever it is and then at some point there's a call in downwards which you know will invite them into the body, into life and actually be like, oh, there's pain, there's trauma and all of that needs to be faced. But what I find is when a person is able to move through that and actually go through the proper downward descent without avoiding it, they actually begin to go on the upward ascent to again. Yep. <laughs> and there's an integration that occurs between the two poles. Yep. And, and this for me is a real spiritual practice of coming back to the middle path, the path between Mm -hmm. both. And for yourself, how do you navigate being 
a psychic being connected, so deeply connected to the upper realms while also maintaining a rootedness in this world to allow your human experience? Hmm. Well, I would say that it's definitely something that I'm still um, learning on mm. because I did spend a lot of time basically out of my body, mm. um, you know, in the past due to trauma and then just also being very psychic. Um, and the navigation of that was... I think I just came home to my body a bit more and a bit more over time, really. I for a, lo- for a long time for me in my journey, I was just trying to survive and, like, get, you know, meet with emotions or whatever and, like, that's all I was doing, you know. All, all I was doing was healing. And, um, and then it's really fairly recently in the last two-ish years that I – my spirit guides talked to me about how I had reached a certain point in my alchemical repairing of myself and that I started to be more embodied in a really deep way and, like, I started to, like, live life more and, like, not just be a hermit in the forest doing, you know, two hours of healing a day because I could because I was only doing that because I could not get through a day without doing two hours of processing. Um and my spirit guides, my higher self and myself, I took myself on this very, very visceral visioning, like alone in my room, like alchemical, um, psychic, putting myself back together. Mm. Um, and then in the the, yeah, the two years or whatever, I had, I had all these visions of like completion and my guides started talking to me differently and they started saying, the flame is lit, um, you know, you're, you're nearly there. And I was like, okay, um, <laughs> where are we going? And then, <laughs> and then, I remember having this one of the most beautiful visions I've ever seen of a sun and a moon come together, um, but like so physical of a vision. And I understood that I had created some kind of completion alchemically. And since that point. Um, I basically just naturally started to be less spiritual, <laughs> like like do less visioning, do less healing and stuff like that and like be naturally more inclined to go and like be social and like go and like, you know, just do more in life, do more. Mm-hmm. And I remember in the, when that first started happening, I was saying to my spirit guides like, what's going on? Like, is this okay? Like, why? Like... Am I turning into like a really superficial person? Like, don't let me. I was like, don't let me turn into a superficial person because I wasn't like meditating for two hours a day, and I was like, or healing for two hours a day. And they kept saying to me, "You earned this. Like, mm. you earned this, and it's okay to be happy." I had to learn that it was safe to be happy and safe to just be in life and not have to be basically in a, a kind of like struggle or whatever, and not be so in the spiritual realms all the time so so now um even though i'm still very psychic and everything my psychic gifts and all of that are more embodied and integrated Mm. i was like someone that was uh, when i was going through my initiations i had really incredible things happen where i was like walking through my house and all i could see was the temple and i couldn't tell the difference between where what what um density of earth that i was in um i couldn't you know i was having i would be sitting at the beach but i would be seeing these visions of atlantis crumbling down and i would get confused and so i was that was just because of the intensity of my gifts and i also had to integrate a um a lot of past life stuff around me and my gifts of a different lifetime that was really coming up where i went a bit crazy with being out of balance and um I had to do work on that in this life to repair that Mm. anyway so so things were you know things are crossing over I'm very psychic and then my spirit guides and I and then I start like chilling more and my spirit guides are like it's okay and I'm like it's just a different way to live for me and now um I still hear my spirit guides I still have access to that and everything but they were saying to me that like I don't have to use it like a, the lifeline that I had to, 
Like I was just all through the day just asking my spirits, guides, and my intuition, what do I do now? How do I help myself now? What do? How do I get to, you know, teach me, teach me, teach me? Because I needed that level of help. Mm. And they were saying like, they were saying it's not, you don't, you don't realise that it's not normal to, you don't need that all the time. And you get to be happy and you get to be embodied. And so to answer your question, it was just a very natural thing that just started being more available. I, have, I, I would say also I got more energy in my body, like physical. I used to have a lot of, like basically I had chronic fatigue. And of course that was all just because of what I was dealing with. And, um, and then I'm like more inclined to like go meet people and got less triggers so I can like go and be social and not think everyone's going to attack me. Like, and then now it's just so just, my, there's a lot of encouragement from my guides just being like, it's okay, like, you came here to um, be a beautiful life. And I saw it as that completion of the alchemical journey was that when the sub the spiritual substance of your essence builds into your being to a certain degree, it starts to get pushed through the rest of the body, through the heart center. And that's where we actually start to change our, um, like the physical form becomes lighter in density. And that's how we actually embody the higher self rather than floating away mm. and all of that. We actually like change form. Over many millennia, we will change form and get lighter and lighter. But um, yeah, so that's what happens. So now there's this overflow of my essence in my field and in my body. And then that expresses out into your li- into my life. And that's what's in a lot of the old alchemical texts and like different religions and stuff, they're talking about the fountain of youth and heaven on earth and all of that. They're actually talking about the union within enough to let you have the overflow of your light mm. into your expression and cool magic stuff with the blood and like, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. I, I think this is one of the most beautiful experiences because that inner marriage you're speaking of, mm. like that that's what I hear when the moon and the sun come together. It's this inner union, like union with ourselves. Mm. And 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 you mentioned how you move from a state of survival mm. I- into one of actually finding the joy in life. Mm. And uh, I think this can be a struggle. I know it's been one of the struggles for myself as well. And is to allow joy. Mm. Because, you know, we've had these experiences, we've gone through whatever it is and in a in ways it can be hard to be like, oh, I can be joyful now. I can be like actually like light and expressive and magical and allow ourselves to be seen in the world. And, and I know for me that's been one of my biggest journeys because I can, I'm okay with getting sad and being really down and depressed and being in the depths of my pain. That's been my natural <laughs> but the real ego death is to allow joy mm-hmm. to be allow myself to be expressive and allow more of that out mm. a- and i feel that's been a similar journey for yourself of being like oh i get joy mm-hmm. uh, i'm allowed joy yeah i didn't and and many people and we don't trust to be happy no we don't trust because we don't trust life mm. because of the like you know, pain that we've experienced and there's a blame of life. Mm. Not recognising that, you know, if we didn't blame life like that, we would trust life and we would be at ease. Like animals are a beautiful example Mm. where they're just in being and they're not like, oh, no, I got hurt from that thing and so just life is rare. They have survival reactions and stuff like that, which we always have because we have a nervous system and they have a nervous system, but... It's, yeah, yeah, and people to trust in joy Mm. because joy is the highest purpose. Like, so as a spiritual teacher, people ask me all the time, like, what is the purpose of life? Or I've had clients ask me that. They don't really love it when I tell them that it's joy (laughs) because people want, like, this big purpose. And, yes, we all have a life intention Mm. of, like, certain concentration of energetic themes that we're trying to embody. But what's the intention of that? It's just for life to be and to exist and life loves to exist as joy. Mm. Oh, let that land. Yeah. 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 It is a big thing to be fully in life, to allow life. Like 
when I think of joy, I think of complete abandonment to life, mm-hmm. like complete allowance of life. Because mm-hmm. like, for me, that's the only time I like truly feel joy in the most ecstatic extent is when I let go. Mm-hmm. When there's no holding on to any stories, beliefs, conditions of who I need to be, who I have to show up as. And beneath all of that, when all that's all gone, there is joy. Mm-hmm. And I, I think what you're speaking of, like the life's intention of purpose, like for me that's a level of alignment where if we're truly living that, we can let go because that's when we can trust life, when we're living who we're meant to be because no longer there's no longer the resistance is there in the way it was before. It's like we're moving down the river. Yeah. Uh, we can flow with it. Oh, I can let go of the fear because I'm flowing with the river. I can let go of that, oh, what's going to happen? And just trust in life, just knowing that it's leading me where it's meant to lead me. Yeah, totally. I um, actually had a lot of initiations about that recently, about trusting life. Mm. Because in some of my traumatic experiences, the near-death experiences that I had, I stopped. I f- from the near-death experience, I felt abandoned by life. And I felt like life hasn't got me and I pushed life away and what, and and I blamed life and what the transmission of or the transmutation of that was, was actually I came back and so life always had me and I didn't see that and I was busy blaming life because I was basically because the pain was unprocessed. Um, but life just is and life loves us so much. And, yeah, exactly, just like flowing down the river is, as I say, again, the examples and flowers and everything, are uh, uh, the animals sorry, are a good example of just being able to flow and then you become one with the natural capacity of joy that is what you are. Mm-hmm. And we can't do that when we're busy resisting and having an identity. <laughs> Fighting around, splashing around in the water, trying to swim against yeah, it. Yeah, we're like, oh no, but mm. like we're actually completely, completely joyful, sovereign being. Mm. Mm. Joy is, is one of, well, is the most beautiful emotion mm-hmm. when we can get there. And I had a point and it seems to disappear and I feel like <laughs> I may come back to it. Cool. <laughs> um, but there was something alive before when you were speaking to your experience of really deeply working with your spirit guides and being in m- that more higher state of consciousness mm-hmm. and not being able to be grounded as deeply in this reality mm-hmm. or this plane, I should say. And I can rem- remember early on during my awakening process, um, it felt like the whole world was crumbling. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had no idea what was happening and I, I felt lost for a long moment. And dur- during that time, like when my reality was changing and all the rules were going out the windows and I was questioning so deeply. I I found a book by Stanislav Grof, which was um, talking about psychosis and the Mm -hmm. differences between that or the similarities between that and uh, spiritual awakenings Mm. and Kundalini awakenings. And so for me, I had this book that was an anchor for me to be like, Mm. ah, someone else has been through this before. I am, I may be losing my mind, but it, it's it's somewhat normal because other people have done this first. Other people have gone through this process and they got out the upside. Yes, it might have been years, years they went through it. and But it, it allowed me to have a light in the tunnel mm-hmm. and allowed me to be like, oh, there's something happening. I can't control it. I don't know really what that is, but it's leading me somewhere. Mm. and for you in that experience because it it, it does sound like there was a lot occurring Mm. did you have an anchor or something that allowed you to just trust that process i guess the anchor was my spirit guides because i said to them like i was like what the fuck is happening Mm. like what i was like what am i meant to do um like just yeah i guess my anchor has constantly been spirit like i'm just like what now like teach me because that's what helped me. Um, but yeah, just to fully answer your question, like one time I was having like a really deep, this crazy 
spiritual experience where I couldn't tell where I was and everything and my guides I couldn't I was asleep and when I was asleep I was in a past life and when I was awake just to get up and get water or something for three days I couldn't really stay awake and I was like delirious like I was seeing things and like all really emotional and it was because I need to be asleep but I had to get up and hydrate and I said to my spirit guide what is going on and she's just she said to me it's normal to experience she said you're experiencing a spiritual delirium and gave me a vision of the caterpillar going into the cocoon and becoming like goo and that's why I felt like goo <laughs> so my anchor has just always been been um that and understanding and knowing that like I didn't I, I guess I'm a kind of person I wouldn't need a, the book to tell me what like you know you're not crazy because I've been psychic all my life so I was just like okay so this is happening mm. Mm. Yeah. So, so for you being connected to spirit guides and having them allies within yourself and in your field yeah. that was something you've always experienced and had yes yeah mm. since I was very small I remember my spirit guides being around me and singing to me and light language they would sing light language to me when I was sometimes when there was you know there's a lot of trauma and stuff and um take me when I was kicked out of my body because of trauma they would take me to like various places and space and they're just helping me and being with me to the degree that they didn't obstruct my sovereignty to go through what I what was going through and so during that development and your connection to them, was there other, any a point where it was like, oh, other people don't have these or like that you recognise these as a gift or something different? Or um, Yeah, I mean, kind of like because I, you know, the trauma I'm talking about is where I was, I grew up in a, a cult environment mm-hmm. and part of, why I was being part of me inside of that was that they were interested in my spiritual gifts. So I'd always, like, they knew I had it and I knew I had it. Like, it wasn't like, whoa, what's going on? Um, and there was a lot of rules and stuff around. Like, I wasn't allowed to use it at home, and which is impossible. But anyway, but then I, um, I think maybe as I got older, it's hard because at that time, like, I was very fractured as well. So I can't say I had a moment of like, oh, I'm at school and this like that classic psychic child figures it out because it was just always there. Mm. And then even as I, when I got older and stuff like um, and more free, I guess I understood that other people, I guess I understood, but I also, I remember having a lot of confusion and being like, why don't people see and like, I remember being like when I was so little, it was being like, "What, what's going on?" Yeah, so not really. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the short answer. <laughs> I, I, um, I think this podcast is all about the long answers, so, yeah. so I appreciate. I really enjoy the story. Good. Can't really do short answers. No, no, that's not what we're here for. No, we're here for depth. Yes. 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 Mm. <laughs> Um, so I feel like going down another segue, mm-hmm. well, and maybe a loop back around to something mm-hmm. you mentioned earlier, because a, a, as you move through that journey of moving more into the world, mm. that what I believe you spoke to was a fear of being um, superficial <laughs> yeah. and checking in with your guide <laughs> yeah. of, oh, am, am I allowed to do this? Yeah. And now you're very much in the state where you're really embracing the material world and allowing yourself to enjoy and embrace it and experience the luxuriousness of life mm. a- and the pleasure that that can mm. allow yourself. Mm. A- and so on that journey there of coming back into a place where you can feel connected to that, where you can recognise this as part of the all and part of life itself, wh- how was that journey uh, <laughs> as it allowed itself to unfold? I think that for me, like, the materialness and, yes, the things I love, like luxury and abundance and stuff, it's really about beauty. Mm. And I think that when I was able to move out of struggle and 
any person when you are able to move out of struggle in a deep embodied way enough you know we're still human and have things going on um but what you understand is like the limitlessness of life and there's no need to restrict Mm -hmm. like so I just and I just felt drawn so I'm always trying to for my the unique answer is that I'm always trying to become more of what I what I am who I am and I just think that I've always been drawn to beauty Mm. in whatever form that I could experience it it's like I think it's just one of my core frequencies Mm. um and also because of what I went through was so ugly it taught me so much about beauty and about pleasure and all of that and that you know when I see beauty whether that's in a material object or it's in nature or whatever I feel so so much gratitude and enrichment from that and it's just beauty and luxury and all of that is just the overflow and richness of life. Mm. It's like an abundant field of flowers and the only resistances that people have to like the material and stuff is all just like programming. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, but it is. <laughs> Oh, are you willing to rant on that a little bit and go a little bit deeper? Huh? Um, on the program. And oh, uh, <laughs> yes, I could rant. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just like when if you do embrace luxury or you, you know, embrace material, it doesn't have to mean that you are materialistic. Mm. It's this, it's this, that programming of like appreciating something's beauty or the benefit of having you know, nice clothes or like whatever it is, to, to, to not limit it and be like, oh, yeah, you just like that because you like superficialities like maybe about status and weird mm-hmm. things like that. And, yeah, if you're going into the material world from that, you're trying to get from it mm-hmm. something, you're not understanding it. And all that's going to do is make you feel more empty. Yeah. And that's why rich people who have like, like really wealthy people and they have all the like the labels and all the like a million cars and stuff the more they buy they just feel more and more empty and they have a lot of money but the money is empty yeah yeah Mm. i I like this approach because what i feel in that is that anything we have should add to who we are Mm -hmm. Uh, and it shouldn't be come coming from a place of if i have this then i will be that Mm. but we do it for the addition like for me the clothes the everything I do it feels like it makes me more of me Mm -hmm. rather than like oh I need this but I'm like no it feels not it's like we're both in beautiful furs at the moment (laughs) and like another (laughs) bonus of the magic podcast episode Uh we get to be in furs but there's this beautiful fin there for for me fake ah okay (laughs) unfake over here (laughs) I'm sitting in the dark corner (laughs) yeah Sorry, go on. Yeah, <laughs> but there's this, like, when we actually allow the world to add to us, mm. like, and feel the addition of it, not from a place of rejection or need, but being like, oh, who do I become in this? Like, what's my transmission to the world and how can I use what the world provides to create more of myself in the world, to reveal more of myself to the world? Because for me, like, clothes and how I live, that's a big part of it. Like, I, I want that to be unique to me, to be my transmission to the world and be like, yeah, people can live like this, not because they have to or they should, but to get, be a permission slip so others can live in the way they like, yeah. so they can have what they want, mm-hmm. that, that they can trust their desires because there is a, often a rejection of desire, being like, desire's bad, but no. If I was an omnipotent God and I wanted a human race to move in alignment what i would do is give them desires that would move them towards where they should go in this world Mm -hmm. and the rejection of any desire not that you need a desire not that you need to have the fin but to just own the desire Mm -hmm. whatever it is being like i want that or i desire that and being unattached to need in it to be who we truly are or having our worth validated by that but just admitting oh I, i want that I want that experience. I want to know what that's like and allow that pull to pull us deeper into life. Yeah, exactly. Mm. That's what the desires are there for. Mm. And um, 
I think something that really helped me was to change my language internally for myself when I remember to, of um, from I want to I desire, mm. because I made the word desire mean for me what it means in its holy essence, which is what you're describing mm. of like that it makes you more. It's the desire. It's the impulse of the light that you are to be more and to be in its fullness. And we see that in nature again. I a lot of nature references today. It's useful. <laughs> but like that flowers and everything wants to multiply. Mm. Everything wants to multiply because life wants to multiply. Mm. And when we resist that, you're saying no to more of yourself. Yeah. 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 And we're closing off. And like in a more material sense, like if you look at, if you're like, oh, I don't, I don't view this world. Like if we look at nature, if we look at any system that's inherent within the world, it moves towards more and more complexity. Mm. Like we, if you look out in a forest, you'll see that amongst the trees, there's other greenery sprouting up. And it's like, oh, the forest wants to be filled with different elements. So our natural systems seek more and more complexity. Mm. And so do we. We're like, oh, who do I become when I do this? And like for me, we can move from pain or pleasure. We can move away from something. And we can be like, no longer do, do I want that. So I'm going to move away and, like we need that that's a great teacher but we can also move from a place of pleasure where it's like oh what does life want me to be drawn towards what interests me what excites me what builds my passion my fire mm. and how can i follow that mm, exactly and i think that the differentiation is in the differentiating healthy pleasure or healthy desire which is that what we're talking about which is the in alignment mm. with your own essence and then people, we have their judgment and resistance when, because we can have unhealthy desires mm. and like all of that and want things and unhealthy pleasure. Mm. But that's just a nuanced thing mm. that if we just clear that up, we're like, oh, okay, just differentiate it and live a amazing, luxurious life. Mm. <laughs> and, and I see like the unhealthy desire and pleasures that generally comes from a place of conditioning. Yeah. Of I need to have a million dollars in my bank account to be worth something. Mm -hmm. I, I need to have the money, the car, the partner to be worth something. It, it's who you should be rather than who you are. And, and for me, that makes all the difference. Rather coming back to myself and asking, what do I truly want? Not what my parents wanted for me, not what my friends want for me, but what um, enlivens my own soul. Mm -hmm. And when we move from that place, that changes everything. Yeah so beautiful mm. Mm. and i feel like that that is a like a beautiful nearly bow <laughs> on, on that because I, I feel that journey is basically what we're talking about of magic and mm. alchemy of being able to shift from the place we move of unhealthy of um disconnect and actually moving into a place of where we're moving from our true self from our higher self and moving into this world from this place Mm -hmm. exactly and we're not here to limit that no. you know we just like life is so i don't know this conversation i'm just like i was like what are we doing you know with it like we, we don't recognize how worthy we are mm. and then we don't live fully mm. we don't live fully and what we're talking about is yeah i just agree mm. we're, we're living fully mm. and it is a thin like I feel like there's just a little bit of aliveness left in that of being disconnected from our own worthiness and being like, I can't have that. I don't deserve that because we've got condition that we deserve less. less. Mm. And coming to a place of recognizing that we are in essence pure, that we are divine beings, that we are here to experience and we get that. We get love, we get joy, we get laughter, we get pleasure, we get connection. We get that. And that's mm. important. Yes. And people were terrified often internally of recognizing that truth of the truth of our innocence and the truth of our goodness. And if anyone's listening, I would ask you to ask yourself, why would it be bad if you were always good and always loved and always holy and always worthy? And explore that question. <laughs> mm. <laughs> for a lot of for a lot of you, if you ask that, it's gonna be if I was always holy, we fully claimed that that's what we are. We feel a kind of people are resisting the grief of the ways that you weren't recognized as, as, as that mm. and the ways that you weren't loved. 
And that's why we don't want to accept it. Because it will trigger up like old pain and things. But it's worth it to, yeah, recognize the truth of what we are. <laughs> that is a nice mic drop. <laughs> uh, and that is the invitation from this episode mm. to sit with that and, and recognize that we are holy, all of it, mm. all the sins that we judge ourselves not for, mm. all the sins that we may condemn ourselves for, that they can be loved too, that we can love that as well. Mm. And it gets to be loved. Mm. 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 Before we wrap this up, mm-hmm. is there anything you want to share or anything still alive from this conversation? I think I would just close on or add that everything we're talking about at the moment, it's all within you. Mm-hmm. It's all within you. And for people to remember that, that, you know, because we're talking about a lot of cool, complex things and stuff, but it's really about what Dean, you were saying what Dean was saying at the end, what you were saying at the end about just coming, like when you're talking about the clothes, of just like, how can I be more myself, mm-hmm. you know? And if you follow that, like to simplify it, you just follow that, just follow what feels more like my truth, like me, like me, like me, like my truth, my truth, my truth. And you will, everything else that we talked about will just unfold. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. That is beautiful Mm. so Beck if people wanted to find you find more of your things Mm -hmm. where would they go where could they find you is there anything else you want to share in that um yeah so I am on Instagram at the Beck Sahasrara the (laughs) spelling is S-A-H-A-S-R-A-R-A I'm sure that Dean will put some links or something. Yeah, I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Instagram, YouTube, same thing, Beck Sarsarara. Um, my website, just just go to the socials because I'm doing a bit of an upgrade at the moment. It will be Um And yeah, if anyone is feeling inspired and called from this conversation, I'd love to have you, especially women, if you're wanting to do your magic mm. together, we can do that and find your power. Mm. please anyone who feels a call to connect with Beck follow follow that <laughs> desire that's what we've been talking about and if that desire oh, is alive it, follow follow <laughs> it trust it because that's what it's about that's where it's leading you yeah. and there's great great power in that for anyone else listening if you are needing to connect with me mm-hmm. head over to the Dean Bentley on Instagram send me a message and I'm sure Beck's the same If you've got any messages from this conversation, please ask away. Share. If you've listened this far, please leave a review. Share this podcast. Let me know what you think. It really helps. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. That's a weird way out.